Okay, um, everybody, uh, it's a total pleasure to have Gavin Crooks with us today. Um, Crooks of the Crooks fluctuation relation fame. Uh, without further ado, please tell us about uh, living history. Um, excellent. Well, thanks for this. this. is a kind of interesting series. Um, so, right, I mean, sort of go back, how, how do we sort of get into science in the first place? And uh, the, the convoluted trajectories we all take, none of them are direct and um, um, paths. So I grew up basically where that arrow is pointing, which is uh, about as far in the middle of nowhere in England as you can get. It's very rural, um, surrounded, a uh, house surrounded by fields. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, like five miles from, from the school and the nearest town and 30 miles from the nearest very small city. Um, and uh, the joke was it always takes an hour just to get to the highway uh, from where, in any direction from where we, uh, we lived. Um, so in some ways actually quite idyllic childhood. Uh, my mother, it was a very scientific household. My mother was a biologist. Um, she studied up through uh, MPhil. Um, I'm sure she would have gone further had, you know, the, in the time period, things have been more um, conducive to, to women um, uh, pursuing careers in science. Uh, but she uh, ended up teaching at a um, college of higher education. I guess um, in, the, in the States, a community college would probably be the closest analogy. It was the last couple of years of high school, first couple of years of uh, university. Um, and so she taught biology. There was always a lot of biology going on. Um, I dissected cow's hearts at the kitchen table. Um, if, 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 if there was fish for dinner and she was gutting fish, that would turn into an impromptu uh, anatomy lesson. Um, so there's always a lot of science going on. I had a pretty good high school too, um, science-wise. Uh, and then my other major passion from when I was a kid was, was computers. Uh, from a very early age. Uh, this was like the first um, computer I really got to play with. My mother brought it home, borrowed it from college one summer. Um, so I've been coding since I was 10 or 11-ish. Um, and so, um, and then, that, you know, during high school years, my, my, my sort of scientific passion with school uh, was chemistry and as, you know, Somewhat analogous to Doug, I think. I, I quite enjoyed this, the uh, process of blowing things up. Uh, again, living outside of the country, you could get away with stuff that you couldn't now. And I, yeah, I, I dread to think if I, uh, if I did the things I, nowadays, what would happen? Uh, but uh, yes, there was, there was blowing things up in the, in the fields and, um, and mixing various chemicals on the, on the kitchen counter. And I had a very good um, early chemistry teacher who was a, kind of a crazy, a crazy, crazy sort of stereotype uh, scientist guy who, 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 who himself would blow up the chemistry that one occasion. So in England, you have to pick your major very early when you're still in, um, in, in high school. And so because of that early influence, I, I picked chemistry and I ended up going to the University of East Anglia uh, to study chemistry. Um, and crucially, I also did uh, that program had a, uh, they had this cunning way of attracting uh, talented students. And that was to offer them uh, the opportunity to spend uh, one year in the middle in the United States. So I spent uh, one year at UMass Amherst. I, it was a great time. I didn't get a lot of work done, but I had a, you know, it was just a, it was, it was a fun experience and, and it's directly responsible for me coming back and you now living in the United States. So as a, you know, we're talking about trajectories here, as an undergraduate, what I wanted to do was synthetic organic chemistry. Um, so I did as an undergraduate, almost no math. I did only bare minimum amount of um, math I needed to do. I did no theory classes, bare minimum amount of quantum mechanics. And I thought I wanted to be an experimentalist. Uh, up until the point at the end of, uh, the, of, of last year where they put you in a lab and I spent six months trying to make uh, various um, organometallic uh, compounds and discovered I was really bad at it. Um, so, so, you know, I then did a, I actually did a master's degree, uh, which was uh, 
bio, uh, uh, biophysics. I measured enzyme connects for a year. Um, and then I uh, moved over to the United States and I spent a year, a couple of years at actually Boston University. And again, I still thought I wanted to be an experimentalist, but I really couldn't quite find my place. And I think I was really good and passionate about it. But then by chance, I happened to take a couple of uh, theory classes. What happened was uh, BU had installed this thinking machines, uh, connection machine, this, this, this really cool for the time period supercomputer. And the way you, and they gave you access, you could get access to this amazing machine, but the way they organized it was you had to take a particular course from your department and then that course gave you access to the machine. And then I say computers are my other real early passion. So in chemistry, I had to take a quantum chemistry course to get access to the, uh, to the, um, to the computer uh, uh, taught by um, David Coker. And I found out I actually quite liked it. And then I had this, about the same time, I also took this course on, um, it was called the Dynamics of Complex Systems by uh, Yinye Yam, And it sort of touched on whole different, uh, many areas of science. Um, and from that, I discovered what I actually really, really enjoyed was statistical physics, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics. And I started studying that um, uh, intensely. Didn't find my place at BU still. I uh, ended up uh, reapplying. And I ended up um, at, oh, here, at Berkeley um, to do a PhD. Now, one trick with, you know, picking where you do a PhD, often you're picking not so much the location as you're picking the advisor. Uh, so I ended up um, uh, reading uh, David Chandler's Introduction to Modern System Mechanics book and learning a lot from it. And so I ended up going to Berkeley and working with him uh, as my advisor in order to, to learn system mechanics. Um, so, okay, but then this is all about, you know, how, how things are quite stochastic and trajectories are uncertain. So what happened was like a couple of years in, I've got my first project out of the way. I'm looking for a thesis project. And Chris Jasinski came by to give a talk about this funny idea he'd come up with. Um, this thing that we now call the Jasinski equality. And at the time, what he'd done looked kind of impossible based on, you know, I just spent the last year or two really studying the basics of what we thought we knew about system mechanics. And this looked impossible. Um, and so I was meant to be working on something completely different. And I actually ended up avoiding my advisor for, for several months as I became obsessed with this. Uh, and eventually uh, came up with um, uh, my own perspective on, on, on why this fundamental relation is true. And in principle, it, it, this, this, the Jasinski quality really is a, it's a very fundamental. It's really the second law of thermodynamics, but rewritten in a different way. And so after a lot of work, I figured out this, this perspective about why that was true. And that has um, turned out to be really cool. And so that has um, uh, influenced a lot of my research since then. Um, however, okay, that was grad school. I kind of burnt myself out. Um, I worked really, really, really hard, um, wrote up a thesis, wrote up a bunch of papers, and then couldn't face doing any more research. And so it was the dot-com boom. So I went and worked for a, a dot-com startup singing Java code uh, for a couple of years. That was a lot of fun, uh, but then everything crashed and burned during the dot-com uh, bust. Uh, so then I had to, I had to, um, I came, I came back to the ivory tower uh, at that point. In the meantime, something really important happened, which was the experiments. When Chris and I had originally thinking about these theoretical developments, they looked very abstract. We could talk about applications in um, computer simulations, but it wasn't obvious how to make connection to reality. Well, it turned out the experimentalists had developed these uh, single molecule uh, um, techniques. You can measure the, the uh, one molecule at a time of say RNA as you apply force to it. And they could then uh, reapply those uh, techniques and actually make these quantitative um, verifications of, the, of these theoretical predictions. 
And so that, you know, ends up being incredibly important. It's all very well coming up with some interesting theory, but if you can't connect it back to reality, then who cares? So that what makes it all, you know, interesting in the end. There's lots of really interesting theory, or it looks kind of interesting, but it's it, you know, if you can't connect it to reality, then 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 it's you, you leave that to the side. And I've certainly done that. Sometimes you follow threads uh, to see where they go, but if it doesn't connect back to something that you can measure, then then it's the wrong approach in that um, overall. Um, so where are we going here? Oh. Mm. So because of those experiments, because uh, the uh, research I'd done ended up being kind of cool, uh, that let me get a job at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And so I was senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab for many years, ran a research group, uh, did a lot of really interesting research in the interface between, uh, so my, my specialty ends up being sort of the interface between physics and information. Uh, so at that very uh, microscopic uh, scale where the thermodynamics matters. Um, but I mean, again, I feel I, I, I resonate with Doug here. At some point, it's, it, it could be too easy in academia to sort of just get into the groove. And, you know, some of my colleagues certainly are happy to, to follow that path. Um, but at some point, I felt I really needed to uh, force myself to do something new. Um, so for the last few years, I've been back in the industry world, uh, in startups, and I was down at Google when the uh, world ended. Uh, and in particular, I'm been working uh, a lot on uh, quantum computing the last few years. Now, this is a long way from organic chemistry, uh, but in the end, it's actually all connects to, uh, together. Again, from my perspective, what looks like a broad set of interests isn't. What I'm really interested in that is that interface between information and physics. So, you know, lessons learned. Um, and again, from other speakers, there's a lot of, you know, truisms that were mentioned. Uh, let me pick out a few that I think are important. Um, the, your trajectory is stochastic. You have no idea where you're going to go or what's going to come next or what part field is going to be important and interesting and you're going to be useful to uh, next. You've just got to follow, follow your nose. There's always this um, trade-off between exploring and exploiting. You want to explore and expand horizons, but then you have to specialize down at some point and really push through uh, an advanced knowledge in some small little area. And then what I'd really like to emphasize is that magic happens at the interfaces, that um, whether it's the interface between theory and experiment or between different areas of science, it feels like doing science on, on easy mode of a cheat code. All you have to do is sort of is, is you can straddle two different little subfields that don't normally talk to each other and spot the connections between those two. Uh, you can make uh, contributions to both those fields and it looks magic to both those fields, but it'll look easy to you. Uh, so it's, the, it's there's those interfaces that often are the most interesting part of science, I think. Um, and so that is the current state of trajectory. We'll see where it goes next. Thank you so much, Gavin. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Um, I see, I actually, I don't see he raised hands. Um, if somebody has a question, please jump in. I just have one question. Uh, it's sort of open for all of the speakers. Like how, what is your personal strategy to deal with academic failures? Um, so so I'm, sorry, sorry, Gavin, I'm just going to let you take this one because we're still recording and the others can jump in after. I missed what you said. What failures? Academic failures? Academic failures. Oh, academic failures when things just don't go, when it all goes terrible. Ah, you just <laughs> got to pick up the pieces and keep going. I mean, um, it, it's one of the tricks to science in general is to figure out when, um, when a project isn't working, and it's time to move on to something else. Um, and, you know, Sometimes for me that has involved writing up as far as we've got um, and realizing this is not the most productive route, but let's write up what we've got. Um, in even if it's not particularly exciting, at least I sort of feel like I can close the book on that. It's, it's also a real issue. You've got to really watch out for, um, for grad students. 
there's, there's, you'll, you'll often meet grad students who are spinning, right? Their project isn't going anywhere. And if they, their advice, it really should be their advisor's job just to push them. So again, sometimes you just got to realize the thing you're working on is just not working and you just got to move to something else. And maybe that's a lateral small move, but you've got to move. And it's, 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 yeah, I don't know. That's just one of the hardest things actually. Know when it's time to give up. Um, I am going to jump in with a question myself and then wrap. Um, so, so this one's about um, writing scientific prose um, on which I know you have opinions. Um, <laughs> so, so, so my question is this, for people going through, I don't know, long dark tea times of their souls, um, are you on the side of scientific prose has to be stiff and you know, uh, devoid of uh, devoid of authentic voice, or are you on the side of go wild, uh, you know, express your despair and defiance and what have you? In uh, your a, it's an interesting question, actually. I mean, it's funny. You read a lot of the stuff that's on the web these days. You know, you can find some really interesting scientific blog posts, and they're often much more interesting to read because they're written in a more, as you say, authentic way. So style we tend to write scientific papers in certainly can be overly dry. Um, there's a balance there, of course. Wait, are you going to say more or that's it? That's it. I mean, it's like, I mean, yes, I think it's interesting. It's an interesting problem. Um, a lot of scientific papers are just way, way, way too, too boring, uh, too long, uh, mostly too long, I think. If I could, you know, I, most papers I think are longer than they should be. Say, you know, say what you need to say. And then if there's some extra stuff, well, okay, put it on the cutting room floor and maybe it'll be in your, another paper. But you're better off with less and more. All right, on the note of less is more, thank you so much, Gavin, for your living history talk and your supporting answers. Um, with that, I'm going to close the record.